let's get this one in. Would you raise your right hand, state your name, and spell your life? Sure. Uh, James Chirello, Borden Town Township Police, and I'm going to spell C H I A R I E L L O. Do you swear or affirm that the penalty provided by law that the testimony you have to give this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Before you can take your seat, keep your voice nice and amplify for us. Sure. Mr. Jack Sandler, when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, officer. Can you just please again reintroduce yourself to the jury? Sure, my name is James Vincent Charles III. I'm a police officer with Borden Town Township Police. About how long have you been employed with Borden Town Township Police Department? It'll be seven years in October. And what's your what's your position with the Borden Town Township Police Department? Patrol officer. And can you state for the jury some of the responsibilities that are associated with being a patrolman? Calls for service, traffic collisions, medical calls, uh, pretty much anything that anybody needs. Now, do you have prior law enforcement experience uh, yes, to joining Borden Town Township? Yes, sir. And could you go through the jury with, with what those items are? Sure. Um, I have a, uh, over a year of experience with the Camden City Police Department, and then I was laid off. I worked with the Temple University Police Department in Philadelphia, and then back in Kansas City, and then for a second round of layoffs, I transferred up to Borden Town. So, in total, about 10 years. And that was prior to Borden Town? Yes, sir. Now, as it relates to your training, uh, are you trained or do you undergo any specific training that relates to the uh, application of emergency medicine? Yes, sir. And those courses or those trainings are, if you could state those? Um, we requalify, I believe, on a two year basis for basic first aid um, and CPR. In addition, I have a training as a bleeding control instructor through the Stop the Bleed program, which was administered through Capital Health at the Trent. And do you have any advisory roles or supervisory roles with any of those um, courses? Yes, I'm one of the instructors for living control with my department. Now, can you, uh, for the jury approximate, how many times have you been required through your uh, position to render medical assistance um, as a law enforcement officer? It's hard to count, but I'd say over 100, 200, 300 calls. I mean, I'd have to actually get the, the notes, but in 10 years, I'd pretty much respond to medical and the majority of those calls, the type of uh, injury that you've uh, experienced or uh, the most serious injuries you've responded to, if you could state those. Um, stabbing, shootings, um, major car accidents, uh, narcotic, uh, narcotics related um, responses for Narcan. Um, now as far as the training, going back to the training, are you required to maintain these skills uh, through continuous courses or trainings? Yes. About how often do those occur? It's on a yearly to uh, two-year basis. Okay. And the last time you performed the, the trainings, if you can approximate. Um, the last time for which training? Um, the most, any of the most recent training. Probably within the last couple of months. Right. Now I'm gonna direct your attention to October 12th of 2018. Now were you on duty that day with Borntown Township? Yes sir. And were you dispatched um, to the Petro gas station in Borntown that morning? I was. And what was that call for? It went out as a uh, report of a stabbing. And uh, when you first arrived, um, how many officers were on scene at that time? It's, I'm unsure about how many were there because the Petro is a large facility, but I know when I responded, I was the second one to assist Patrolman Hess, who had uh, responded to the actual victim. And upon your arrival and observing Officer Hess, uh, what else did you observe? Uh, I observed a male lying on the ground near the, what they call the, the fuel island, which is inside the sidewalk right in front of the store. And at that time, had anyone else uh, begun treating the victim? Yes. Um, I learned that there was a stabbing victim there, and uh, Patrolman Hess was administering oxygen, and there were several Petro staff members who came out to assist. I believe they had grabbed um, clean, sterile towels that they would use to clean up to keep pressure on the wound. Can you describe the victim's state of consciousness at this point? He was conscious. Um, he was groaning and in a lot of pain, but he was able to answer basic questions like his name and where he was from, although it was pretty labored. And again, the first thing that you did, if you can just explain to the jury, what, what was your first steps upon um, getting up to the victim in this case? I assisted my, uh, my colleague, Patrolman S. Um, we did initial patient assessment. I know that Patrolman has had relayed uh, that the subject was complaining of breathing, but I knew the most important thing at that point was bleeding control, so we began to administer pressure to his uh, abdominals. Uh, 
Now at any point, in order to better survey or diagnose or treat the wounds, um, did you have to remove any clothing? Yes, uh, after we did the initial, we wrapped a pressure bandage around the abdomen, and then when I began to actually assess the patient, I noticed small little holes in the white shirt. So I lifted the shirt up, and then I, that's when I noticed uh, there were several other stab wounds. And those were located uh, approximately where throughout the body? There was, um, there was uh, one wound right on the sternum, I'd say like the quarter size, and then there was two right on the rib cages, about the size of like a dime on each side. Upon observing uh, those injuries, did you take any other steps other than the pressure bandage? Yeah, I, I told my colleague basically to just try to cover up um, the wounds as best he could with either plastic or uh, his gloved hand. And then I ran to my um, my patrol car where I had a, a more substantial medical kit and I was able to get a occlusive dressing that commonly known as chest seals. And what is the purpose of a chest seal? It's to uh, prevent a, um, a sucking chest wound or a, what they were calling pneumothorax. Uh, he was complaining of air, so uh, he was complaining that he, he, he was having trouble breathing. And given the, um, the location of the, the wound, I assumed that it might have been something related to that. So it's to prevent any more air from coming into the lungs. And you observed a wound um, that you believed was requiring a uh, chest seal? Yes. And where was that? Uh, the one in the sternum area. About how big was that wound, if you recall? It was about a quarter size. <clears throat> Now, through your efforts, uh, eventually did other emergency personnel or services arrive, including uh, an ambulance? Yes. Um, and those individuals specifically, um, did EMTs arrive? So uh, we had an ambulance crew arrive, uh, the fire department were also trained EMTs, um, one of, and multiple police officers who have basic first aid and CPR. And but no point did you relinquish responsibility or step away from the victim in this case, correct? No. Now, prior to uh, strike that, uh, following the treatment that you administered, um, eventually there was a decision made to transport the victim, correct? That's correct. And what facility did they want to transport the victim to? They made the determination to transport the uh, victim to Capital Health uh, with Helene Fold, which is an emergency facility in Trenton. And why, why was that decision made? The, the treatment center, not some somewhere else. Well, they went back and forth between whether they were going to med evac him or drive, but it was the closest center that uh, provides uh, trauma medicine. And when you say med evac, you mean uh, the helicopter. <clears throat> so that decision, uh, again, um, upon reviewing the nature of the injuries, that's the the decision was made to transport him to Helen Fold. Yeah, that would have been the closest trauma center. Following that decision, uh, where was it decided you would be uh, at that point? Um, I I following that decision, where was it decided? What's the question I'm trying to follow here to the school for me? I can rephrase your honor. Uh, it was following that decision, where was it decided would be that, where would you would be at that point? That's the question? Yes, your honor. All right, I'm going to overrule the objection. You can answer the question if you're not sure. Um, I was uh, told by Captain Mount to ride in the ambulance with the EMTs. So you were to maintain and stay with the victim? That's correct. Um, do you know why that decision was made? Objection. Objection if, if the witness is speculating. If you know or if he doesn't know, you can't answer. But if you know, you can answer. Given my training and the fact that I had, had um, first-hand knowledge, I was able to relay that to the EMTs, and then we were actually waiting for paramedics to meet us. So the decision was to, to ride to the hospital and they would meet us afterwards so we could relay this information. How many personnel were with you in the ambulance when you began transporting the victim? Including myself, it would have been, there would have been four others, the victim, the two EMTs, and then the fire chief who drove the ambulance. And you stated earlier that uh, you were to meet paramedics uh, in route. Uh, why? What was that? What was the purpose of that decision? They didn't want to wait for the paramedics to arrive, so they decided to drive to the hospital. The paramedics can obviously drive faster in, a, um, in, in their SUV than the, than the ambulance, so they met us on 295. During the ambulance ride, could you describe the 
level of consciousness or coherentness of the victim at this time? Sure. Um, the victim was in a lot of pain. He was moaning and groaning, but he was able to respond to questions that I was asking. And um, But I did notice there was times where he, his eyes were really getting to roll to the back of his head. But he still never really lost consciousness. But he was just, from his actions, he thought he was in a lot of pain. Now, at some point, was the decision made to... Uh, remove the victim's clothes? Yes. And why was that decision made? They generally will remove clothes for trauma so that they can treat the victim better and do a patient assessment. Now upon arrival at the hospital, uh, you do eventually turn over the victim to hospital staff, correct? That's correct. And uh, what happens to the items that were taken um, at that point? They were initially gathered up uh, by staff, security, and then they were passed off to me. And what did you do with those items when they were passed off to you? I, um, I secured them as best as I could for my, for my car ride, and then when I got back to the station, I, um, I packaged them in, in um, paper bags, and then they were turned over to the uh, prosecutor's office CSI unit.